Thank you. Um, yes, I'm going to talk about connecting the data infrastructure with the data flow. Before we actually get started, I already asked, so four of you, sorry, <laughs> don't kill me for a few slides. Do you actually know what the data flow is? Yeah, well, uh, it comes from the, but yeah, more or less one. OK. So we're going to be seeing how to build a data infrastructure or a data platform or basically connecting data from A to B with this idea of the data flow. Um, not a spoiler, but this is a very old concept. I'm Pere. I'm slash software architect slash search slash data. You know, at the end, I try not to cause so many problems building systems, but mostly around data. What we are going to see today is basically um, patterns for integrating applications. Surprise, surprise. Connecting data infrastructure or building data lakes is just another problem of connecting uh, programs or in enterprise or startup integration patterns. We're going to see Apache and iFi as one of the tools that you can use to do that exercise. There are many others, but this is lately my tool of choice. We're going to see examples of how to connect and use this tool for especially control data change, so how to connect data from database A to database B or data source A to data source B. Um, also, a few other examples, and we're gonna actually going to see how to properly put NIFI into production. Because, you know, it's like Elasticsearch, it's very nice to just dump something that works in your local machine, but fun begins when you put that shit into production. OK, let's integrate all the things. Enterprise integration. Don't be scary. At the end, this is what we've all been doing as soon as we have more than one application. OK, so we basically, the, what is, this is about is about making different applications work together. For building a data platform, it would be like, you know, like putting data or pulling or pushing data from different other systems into your data lake. These applications works in different computers. So we are working, you know, like each one is from his mother, from his father, you know, so in it's in, def in different places, speak different languages, have different education, you know, so one might misbehave and the network might just go nuts, you know, so it's very important to understand that, you know, these different points. Some applications might need to be integrated even though they were not designed for it, you know? You might get two kids who are not happily playing together, and they have to do it. And this is a very challenging process. Because you know, like when you get two applications that you really have to make them talk to each other, or share data, or do whatever nasty thing, you know, and they are not designed for it, it's, it's going to be fun. One, unless my experience, this is the most common case. Unless we have been designing things with APIs and stuff like this, this is very, very common to face, especially in big companies when you have legacy, legacy stuff. This and other issues is what really makes integration applications happy, a, f a fun thing to work on, less for me. Each integration faces different needs and criteria. The first one is application coupling. Okay? You get two applications, they live in different places, we should minimize the dependency from each other. If both applications have no dependency, they work completely different models, it's easier to just send data from A to B. When two applications are tightly coupled, you know, one makes assumptions. What is the other one going to be? Or what or, or to what do for this talk, for, for this action? So this is making this problem harder and harder for these assumptions. And when something breaks, just chaos. Everything is, it breaks. Another one is integration simplicity. How many of you has been actually uh, doing work in legacy, like integrating or changing legacy projects? So much fun, right? Trying to integrate it with a new application, making sure that the data flows correctly from left to right. You know, always people asking, let's go do or write a lot of code to this legacy application so it's now integratable. Somehow, each integration should be simple. Simple enough that you, know, like, you don't, don't do a lot of changes. Data formats, 
and timeliness. Very important, data formats. As in humanity, many people speak different languages. Some application might speak XML, other will speak JSON, other will speak plain text, crappy format invented by, by the developers, etc., etc. So it's very important to handle different data formats. Timeliness. If we do an integration, especially for, I don't know, not for a data platform, but for any other thing, it's good to have this reduce as amount as possible. So if you have to integrate something, as long as you are doing it, the more fun it's going to be. Data or functionality. Another common criteria for or to group the integrations is, what do you share? Data? You call and share data, or you ask another function to, ask, to do some calculation for you. And last but not least, the way of communicating. We might have two applications. We might integrate through synchronous communication, you know, so it takes more time to, to respond, or we might basically do that, that work asynchronously. After that, there is a lot, um, also different ways, and only four different ways to do integration. There is nothing else. I mean, it's just been like this since 20 years or more, and it's probably going to stay like this for, for a long, long time. File transfer. I work, one of the people I work for is a very old company. I think it's 175 years, and it's still sharing a lot of files, you know, like in the old days. I put your, your carpet with files, and then someone else is going to take it. In that case, it's putting files into an FTP, so good luck with that. No schema, no nothing. Um, yeah. So basically, sharing files is one way of integrating. Another way of integrating is with a shared database. You know, like you get one central database, many applications write to them, one, some write in one part, some write in another part. If you do microservices, it might be one pattern that you have seen where you just you have your microservices very isolated, you know, very nice everywhere, and then a big Oracle database. Put Oracle, put Postgres, put whatever you want. That's the central point of everything. That's another way of integrating. Another way of integrating is RPC. No, like you basically integrate through a web service, for example. Okay, you ask another application to do some, give you some data, do calculations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the last way of integration is messaging. I mean, we all love Kafka, right? We don't like GravityMQ so much, but Kafka is like being deployed everywhere. Okay, we get one application. This application encapsulates some data, put it in a bus. And then the other application on the other side is going to take that bus, read the message, and do something. Easy peasy. It encourages high cohesion. It, this, me this method specifically it encourages that each application does one thing and himself. This is very good. Remember what we said about integration simplicity. And also encourage low addition. You know, so like there is no coupling. I do one thing, I put it in a bus. Hopefully, you will put not logic shared in the past, like all days with, with um, SOA and stuff like this. And yeah, the other one will get to work. All this is not rocket science. It's been written by Greg something. I clearly cannot remember the family name. He was the former CTO of Allianz. And is now, I think it's BP something at Google. He wrote a nice book called Enterprise Integration Patterns that is also a nice website where he basically listed all possible integration patterns that you might face in your life. This book, I think it's from the beginning of the, of the, of the century, of the 2000s, and it literally lasts everything. Application A, application B, how the message is constructed, the routing strategies, splitting brokers, scatter and gather, the envelopes, the channels, the letter Q, uh, synchronous, not synchronous, publish, subscribe, um, the systems, you know, like the translators, everything that you guys do with Logstash, NiFi, uh, FluentD, um, Kettle, everything is this. So if you work on such environments, take a look. It's really informative. So we saw the theory, more or less. Now we're going to see a little bit what is Apache Nifi, so you two can go to sleep. <laughs> Apache Nifi is an easy-to-use, powerful, and reliable system to process and distribute 
data. It looks like an ATL, like an ETL, so you can do things like in, like in, like in Kettle, but not, it's not exactly like this. It would be something like you know, um, a pipe, OK? Um, it's a system that's very similar to things like a Spark, in some sense. It's configurable. So you can really configure a lot of things. You can change parameters left and right. It has one thing that is very powerful, that's tolerant, or that the guaranteed deliveries is configurable as well. So you can uh, do, for example, control the back pressure. If you get, I don't know, one gigabyte of messages pending, you can say that the, the new ones are going to be discarded, or the old ones are going to be discarded. So you can control back, back pressure. Probably the only thing in back pressure control that they lack is, um, is um, reactive streams. So the back pressure is controlled automatically somehow. Um, the flow can be modified at runtime, dynamic prioritization. You know, it, it's very, 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 very configurable. It's also secure. This is a very important topic. I'm using uh, log, um, NIFI a lot when I have two data centers, and I have to send a message from data center A to data center B. I can encrypt it. It's going to traverse the, the network, arrive to the other data center, and be decrypted. Very, very nice. It's also multi-tenant, and it has authorization. So I can let one team do one thing, another team do the do other thing. It's web-based. Well, I will try to behave and not say more, na more na nasty things. So you can literally let everyone do it. You know, it's web-based. They don't need to write a Scala code like in Akastream. They don't need to uh, do a complex JSON things in Logstash. No, it's web-based. Everybody can just drag a box and work. It's, as I said, highly configurable. It has data provenance. OK, so like every message that enters the system is audited. OK, so I know who touches what and when. And this thing is extrapolable, so you can just take this, this box out and use it in, a, in another system as well. OK, so data provenance, very important. Everything that enters the system is going to be tracked from the beginning till the end, everything. And it's designed for extension. So you can write your own integrations, um, either as a form of plugin or as an extension with, with a script. And as I said, it's secure. NIFI was built to automate the flow of data between systems, actually from the NSA. It's part of the first batch of projects that NSA uh, outsourced to the, or kind of open source it to the, to the Apache Foundation, and it's very, very powerful. But what is data flow? Data flow is basically an automated and managed flow of information between systems. It's, also a, it's a pattern that we also see in um, designing microcontrollers. At the end is, you know, like I get an entrance, and I do a collection of small operations, and I do these small operations on top of a bunch of data. This is how it looks. OK? This is basically the, the, the UI. As you will see, as a very good open source project, the UI looks not so nice, but it works. Um, here we see the different areas. We can see how to operate the plugin, the, the, the different um, boxes. We can see an area here where to add more, um, more boxes and construct the thing. Also, we see the different flow here. This is what it's called the flow or the graph of actions. Here, you will consume one message. This message will be, um, in that case, read from Kafka, go to a queue, evaluate the JSON path, and then put to this queue and this queue. So it's put to Elasticsearch. And here is, again, evaluate another JSON path. And here, we do a routing on the attribute, you know, and it, you have a collection of different actions. I'm going to tell you more about that later on. Few concepts to understand what this, or what this, sorry, what this actually was about. The flow file. Everything, or like the lowest unit of operation in NIFA is a flow file. A flow file has a collection of metadata, very important. In NIFA, you are supposed to operate on the metadata. OK? So it's not like in other systems, like Logstash, where you are supposed to also operate on the content. If you operate on metadata, it's easy. You know, you get the keyword, you get a small payload, so it goes much faster. Also, you get the, the content. 
because you know, like you get this bunch of content that can be any format. By default, uh, NiFi operates uh, operates using Abro. Using Abro, the processor, everything that does an operation, whatever kind of operation it is, is called a processor. A processor can be something that you can that can pull information, something that can receive information, something that I don't know can enrich information. You know, at the end is a box that does something for you. It's good that this processor does something small and as fast as possible. This uh, NIFA has a rich collection of processors, and one, for example, that we can see here is the consume from Kafka. You basically define a topic, a queue, and go, consume. You can see a very powerful thing of the processors that in the UI, you get the status of the processor, if it's operating or not. You get the version that you are running. You can run actually different, different versions of a processor. You can have Kafka 10 and Kafka 11, both in the same place. Um, and you get the statistics. You get how many bytes in, how many things were read and write, how many stuff went out, and the time that this, this stuff was, was uh, running. One very important thing of NIFA is auditing. So everything that happens, there is a metric for that. A connection. Obviously, if we want to send things from A to B, we need a queue in the middle. And so to connect, every processor gets different kind of queues. We, you can define them, be like, this is success and match, but you not know, like every processor gets his own uh, set of queues. Interesting thing of the queues is that you can put priorities. And you can put back, uh, back, um, back pressure control here. So yeah, it's very dynamic as well. The process group. As you can imagine, if you, know, you get a big, big thing, um, you might want to group some of the stuff. And for this, you use the process groups. This, if we click in here and we go inside, we will see another new, new flow. This is a very powerful abstraction because the process groups can be either in here or can be in a remote machine. Because NIFA can also work as a, as a remote, as a, remote um, as a distributed system. And we see here, like, it's the same thing, you know, like, how many stuff is running, how many is stop, queued, in, out, easy. No, like the same exact, exact flow as we saw before. As I said, NiFi can be either distributed or working in a, in a single node. This is the common architecture. You know, we see uh, the controllers, we see the extensions, we see the web server that we have been seeing. It's a Java application, so we're ready to use a shit ton of memory. Um, and also, we see the three repositories. One to control the metadata of the flow, one to control the, exactly the content, of the of the each message that arrive and want to control the provenance okay the auditing like all the flow of what has been happening some uh, uh, all the time in the in the in the in the pipeline this is um, this can work as a, as a distributed system using zookeeper okay i don't know if you like zookeeper but it's also one of the, the other nightmares that I, that I have together with with uh, with docker um, it's very nice because you remember the the, the process groups you can have one process group in a remote machine and point it from one to the other one. You will always have a master. So it really lets you have very good multi-tenancy for, for such a project. If you start with NiFi, don't go distributed from day one. Just do something in a small box, and it's still very, very powerful. So this is just when you really get bananas, literally. OK, let's go and take a closer look to how NiFi looks like. This is actually how knife. Oops, nope. Sorry, I need to share my screen. Yep, it's gonna work. Or displays arrangements. You see, this is actually how uh, knife looks like. Oh, this is the demo. Okay, so as we said before, this is the, um, the flow that, uh, that uh, I was presenting you. This flow is um, to use, oops, probably I should put something bigger. Yes, sorry, I bought my connector in China, so it's a cheap thing. Um, yeah, you. Basically, consume Kafka events, 
um, and do all the operations. This is an example I'm going to show you in a video. Why in a video? Because I really failed to make the demo run in another network together with Docker. So unless you guys can see something running. Um, this is uh, implementing what's being called as control data change. Okay? So it uses um, a MySQL database where it, you put some data. This uh, MySQL database gets operations like insert, update, delete, create table, alter table, etc. And there is one small project called Maxwell Daemon that basically connects to this MySQL master and acts as a, as a slave, as a replication slave. This Maxwell will receive all the updates from the transaction log, like every insert, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and will stream them to Kafka. Um, after the Kafka is where NiFi starts. So from here, it starts consuming the events and it starts doing all the magic. What this is basically doing is it consumes the events, okay, and evaluates them to extract the metadata from Maxwell because Maxwell always sends you with a data, database name, type of operation, old and new data, you know, all the necessary information for you to operate with. If you are curious, this is the Maxwell project. Okay, so for every insert, it generates this kind of data, you know, and, and blip, work. And yeah, this is what you get at the end. Um, in the data formats, you see like for every insert, you get the data, you get the position, you get the transaction ID. It literally acts as a MySQL slave. And from here, you send this information to, to here. And in here, what we do is we basically inject them into Elasticsearch, okay? And I hope this will work. So my audio capabilities are very bad. So I hope we can do that together from the noise, from the sound. Hostia, buena idea. Ah, esto. OK, cool. Thank you. Sorry for the back and forth. It's working. It's playing somehow. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry. We, we do it like this. We do it the old way. Maxwell, they will be uh, serialized in a structured format uh, in JSON uh, to Kafka and from Kafka. Sorry, my, my tone in the demo is just terrible. We are going to <laughs> stream them uh, to Elasticsearch. This is a very simplified example, but uh, can be something, for example, to index your Elasticsearch database or to perform a migration from one data. You might listen to my kids one. screaming on the background, maybe. Here we see the structure of this uh, flow. This flow goes uh, from a Kafka consumer. This Kafka consumer is listening to a specific uh, topic from Maxwell, where all the changes has been streamed to. Then it uses uh, evaluate JSON path to uh, select where these actions should be performed. Then we see another evaluation JSON path um, processor uh, to see where these, um, to detect uh, where these uh, um, options or operations that has been performed, either it's an add, an insert, uh, an update, or a delete, uh, and then uh, perform the, with a root on attribute, each specific action uh, into an executed this. by uh, if a consumer. This we is the configuration of, of the of the how it Kafka is, uh, performed here, as we explained before. Name, ID, type, the bundle where it's stored, the scheduling options. Since here is executed by uh, time driven, we see here a particularity of this uh, of all the processes in in uh, in Nifi that it uses to concurrent task. The properties we see how this is streaming from. Is a specific uh, URL and port. You can uh, specify security protocols, the topic name, the format. The you can basically put any configuration option that, that, that you that want. You, use, you regularly use uh, to uh, connect uh, to a Kafka uh, topic. 
also one very interesting one, uh, one very interesting uh, consumer uh, processor story in uh, in uh, NiFi is uh, the Everway JSON path. In here, we can see how we can extract data based on JSON path from the content into the attributes. We should remember, as we said before, that in NiFi, it's uh, it's it's more efficient or it's more encouraged to operate on attributes than on content. This lets NiFi go faster uh, than most of other uh, streaming solutions similar. We see here. Here, what it basically does, it extracts attributes from the co from the content to uh, data from the content to the attributes. And that works pretty, pretty nice. And I'm going to just stream this a little bit uh, to the example because it's going to be much easier. So as I said before, you stream the data to Elasticsearch. And then, you know, like when we are here, it's table name, it will do a delete operation in Elasticsearch. And as well for the other ones. So now that we have this uh, working, we can go to the, to the MySQL uh, world trends. And see here, we will create a full database. This database is already being present here. Now we'll create a new table. As we can see, here we have the new table. We will insert a few data of this table. In, in this table, like this three records. Now if we go back here, we see how three new records are being processed. Also here we see it in the in the in the add operation. This is basically to keep a lot. We go to Elasticsearch, see how now we have two more indexes, new table log and new table raw. If we basically query the new table uh, raw index, this is basically match all operation for the search. We see how here we see the one. We see here how, you know, like all the events that has happened in the, in the index for this type, it, in this table, new table, it was actually being streamed here. And this is a very powerful thing. So uh, uh, one thing that I like is actually explaining stories, you know, like one project I'm working right now, basically I'm implementing the same thing to connect legacy database with new database. We need to do some changes in the format, so we put an iFi to do the same thing. We uh, change the format, and then we put it in the new database. Here we can control, update, delete, alter table, everything you want. But to just go a little bit forward to that one, I'm going to just stop the demo here. So thank you very much for the help with the audio. <laughs> um, as I said, this is Maxwell. It controls everything. One nice thing here is the root on attribute that we didn't saw literally in the video. Root and attribute is basically, you know, doing an expression language. NIFI has a ex very powerful expression language that lets you define things from if, while, selections, lowercase, literally all the most of the branches you want to do. What is this actually doing? This is actually doing <coughs> the attribute type from the flow is putting lowercase and doing equal insert. And it's saying that everything that fulfills this property, this rule, it's going to go to the edge add. Everything that fulfills the delete one or the update one will go to the respective edges. And like this, I can select which operations to execute. I can also do laces in, in, uh, in NiFi. So if, um, I don't know, the update fails because Elasticsearch was lazy at that moment, um, we can always do the, the retry later on. So it's very, very powerful. Now here I can do something like this if I want, you know, and I can select which kind of relationship I want to execute. Retry, for example. And now, if the retry edge is executed after the flow, it will basically pull again to the retry. Or I can ignore the retry and put it down to a, to a dead letter queue. I can literally do whatever I want. Um, also, I wanted to show a very powerful example here, because NiFi, as I said, it looks like an ETL, but it's not an ETL. OK? My biggest discussion with former companies who you do ETL that they want to be introduced to the big data wall is, can I do a SQL join? Can I get a bunch of flows and do a SQL join to basically do them together here? So someone from there is just smiling because he might have found the same question. Um, NiFi, don't do that, okay? NiFi is very good at working at one chunk of work, 
at a time. Okay? So it's not kettle. It looks like kettle, but it's not kettle. Um, to do the work of merging, we get the merge processor. Okay? The merge processor is basically responsible of do the bin packing. Okay? You can uh, define here the algorithm you want to do, how to do the, conc the concatenation, which attribute you want to keep, number, maximum and minimum number of entries, size as well, file, etc. And why is this interesting? Because, you know, for example, let's put this processors at work. Let's also start this one and this two here. Well, I'm not going to start the email one because I didn't finish the configuration. But, you know, like here, what it's actually doing is listening to a TCP port. Okay? I'm going to do a connection to a TCP port, send a message. It's going to go to this queue. It's going to do some merging. And at the end, it's basically going to pack five messages and then put them to a file. I can also send messages, send emails um, in here. Go here. Actually, I don't remember which port I put here. So we should check here, 99. Okay, so I can do a connection to here. And I can do message, one message, two message. Three, message, four, message, five, it's taking too long. Okay, it's basically sending all the message. If we refresh in here, we will see like it's doing more stuff out and also doing more stuff out here. And this thing here got one message in. One funny thing of NIFI is that this one is the last processor of this flow. Okay, so it will never things send things out. Even though he did an action that put stuff on a file. Okay? So this is sometimes confusing to people like, didn't do anything here, so it's a zero? Yes, because it didn't write anything out. Okay, it writes things, but during the execution of the of the of the flow. Okay, we see here, like this is basically a put file um, processor. It's putting all the events that are arriving into a directory. Okay? If we go here to the um, temp passwords merge, we see this flow. Okay? This is just the dump of the flow that happened. Okay, here we see like the message one, message two, message three, message four. This is just something that was in the buffer from last executions. Okay, so it packs the thing. Okay, so remember, NIFI, not an ETL. SQL joins, nine. Nine. Okay, it's one of the very, very important difference here. You can also compress content in, in NIFI. So I'm not going to show you now, but you can just basically do a compress and you know, like reduce the payload. You can do also decompress, you can do encrypt, you can do a lot of things to just go faster. And this is a good thing. Because if beforehand I'm extracted the attributes that I need, you know, to make decisions on the flow, I can just compress the payload and go faster. And let's go back to the presentation for the last bit of important operations. Okay, so we basically deploy use NiFi, we love NiFi, we want it now to use it in production. Important tips: maximum files handles. NIFA uses shit ton of files, okay? Um, because, you know, like it can be opening a lot of files to do the put, to do the get, etc., etc. Make sure that you let him not cry for resources. As well, for the fork processes. If you execute, this, if you use a script, for example, it, or stuff like this, it uses a lot of um, processes, so also make sure he doesn't starve in here. Otherwise, you will have problems. As well, for the TCP. You know, one thing that you can do is basically have a web server that's listening to a TCP port in an action. So you basically got a web server out of the box. Make sure that the poor guy get TCP so enough TCP, TCP sockets. As well, one that, that is very important that some, a lot of times is always forgotten is the time wait state, okay? Make sure that this sockets in this state time out because otherwise you will have a lot of sockets that are just waiting for nothing. Okay, because every time that, you know, like the way that this thing works, uh, like any other of this system, like this uh, advice will apply to Logstash, Fluendi, and all, uh, yeah, all of these systems. Um, yeah, it will be interesting. So make sure that time wait 
basically uh, finished. Otherwise, you know, like you will do a, a an LS off the whole socket, you will see a shit ton of them in as a timeout. <laughs> Sorry, as a time wait. Um, never, ever, 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 again, ever in your life do swap. Not just with NiFi, with anything, anything else that relates as a, as a big data system. Never, ever, ever in your life. And if you want to do it, make sure to then call me as a freelancer. I can go there and fix it. It's billing hours, you know? But never, ever do it, please. You know, here you have ways of doing it, like with a CTL or when you mount it, etc., etc. Okay, so that's basically all. Questions, disagreements, dead threats. <laughs> By the way, before I actually forget, I didn't put it on the slides, my failure. This is available from here. I will also tweet it. This is the code of the demo that you've seen that you've seen here. It also includes explanations how to run it, you know, and how much I love Docker and all that kind of things. <coughs> um, but here you will actually uh, do the play, the have the option to play with it yourself as well. So, questions? Yeah, I have a question about configurations. Um, can you put them into, have the configuration into source control, for instance, and how do you manage like rollbacks if you did uh, if you post the wrong configuration? Which kind of configuration? The flow? Like, yeah, the flow. The flow is a shitty thing because the flow only works um, like this. So. Okay, this is the main directory of NiFi. Here you can see the content repository and all the other stuff. And in the conf directory, there is this flow XML GZ file. Up here, okay? GZ. GZ. Sorry, I'm from Barcelona. You should be happy I even am able, I'm able to speak English. <laughs> <laughs> we are very well known together with the Japanese people to have the worst English ever. Um, yeah, this has to be compressed. So if you want to manage it, like in, 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 as in source control, etc., etc., you can do it. But also, NIFA reads this, this file at, at starting time. So you will need to um, put NIFA down and do the reloading, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is one of the flows, how to reload configuration from NiFi. I think that the last version, they tried to do something to increase the, the flexibility of this, but it's basically one of the <coughs> shitty yeah, So things. no plans of fixing it? As far as I know, not. Okay. So it's just the shitty thing okay. on, on Thank the you. platform. So uh, what is the main use case for this system? As I understand, it's just for playing for data, data scientists to play around with the data, because uh, in production, if you change your line in your uh, data flow and it breaks, uh, well, it's bad. <laughs> well, actually, what the way that you deploy NIFA usually is with environments. Okay, so you start moving the, the flow files from one environment to, the, uh, to the another one. Um, it's not a system for playing. It's a, a system that's actually being deployed in big companies. Do you guys know Outfittery? Outfittery, yeah. So, Outfittery from Berlin. Yes. Yeah. So I'm basically helping them as a freelancer building the data platform. And most of the technology behind the data platform is NiFi. It's basically doing very good work there because it's helping in integrating the whole bunch of different applications all work together in one source. Also as well, sorry, <laughs> also as well, um, I'm helping other projects, for example, for Spring and Nature, a big editor in Berlin, where we also use that to integrate legacy database with a new database. It's everything with NIFI is basically an integrator. You know, it's a thing that can move data from left to right and doing it as a speed of light. Yeah, okay, but how do you uh, deploy it? How do you uh, fix these bugs in your data flow? How you notice about it? So, How you notice yeah. about bugs or problems? You uh, test NiFi uh, by either manual testing or either test on the processors or test on the different outputs. Testing a system like this one is a bit hard because it's an integrator, so it basically um, you make sure that its operation does what it's supposed to do, and that the whole thing does what it's supposed to do. 
Um, so you have some integration tests for... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. What's the scaling strategy for NiFi? Scaling? Yeah, how does it scale? Um, it scales through a uh, zookeeper, and it basically, um, it has different ways. But it can, for example, work by having um, round robin. So you uh, select different flows to operate with, and also works uh, by you get one of these processors, and one can be remote. Do you remember the processor group? One can be a remote processor group. So you can go to another node and send the content there. I don't know, maybe because this is a node with more resources, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's a scale by sending things out. You can also have one of these servers that is set at the in front and have multiple of them and have a, a load balancer on top. But it, the, way it is, the way that the cluster works is through Zookeeper. And it's always a master that's the one who decides where the shit goes, et cetera, et cetera. And it creates the nodes automatically on the Sorry? It, it creates like the, the applications, the services, or the processors automatically on the nodes. So it yeah. knows how to create. Yeah, and yeah. yeah, yeah. It's basically an, a new NiFi instance. Uh -huh. No, it's a NiFi instance living on every node, and then to keep her working as, as, a, as, a, as a coordinator. Cool. Uh, thanks, everybody, for being here, for being part the, for this uh, event. We hope that you really enjoy it. And we hope to see you the next year in the Berlin Bats World 2019. Thank you for everyone.